Dear students, welcome to this class of Applied Environmental Microbiology and today we are going to talk about how our tools from in microbiology help us understand the environmental routes of pathogen proliferation. So for example, if there is an outbreak and I need to know what is the source of pathogen in the environment, why are people falling sick and what would be the most efficient intervention for me to tackle the problem and to put an end to the outbreak, then I need to understand the microbiology of pathogens in environment and how they have proliferated and been transported in the environment and exposed to human population. So in today's lecture, we are going to talk about epidemiology, which is an extensive science that deals with how diseases spread, how they are contained and it studies about um, the lifespan of a disease, how outbreak begins, how it plateaus and then how, it, um, how the human population recovers. So let us get started. We want to start with MERS. MERS was an infection that caused quite a havoc in 2012 when it infected many people in Saudi Arabia and Middle East. So it is MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was a viral respiratory disease that was caused by a novel coronavirus. Now please note here that the word novel. So this was not a virus that was known before, but it was a new uh, form of virus particle that was infecting people in Middle East. So what do we do as humankind when we are faced with these novel pathogens? And this is a good point for me to uh, Mm, reiterate that it is not that all pathogenic diseases are already known, characterized and many that are known we do not have uh, perfect solutions to treat them and even the ones that are uh, unknown they show up their faces every now and then. Also the ones that we know evolve over time and turn into very different microbe. For example, we do know diseases like HIV, viral diseases like HIV, they uh, mutate, the virus mutates, it undergoes a succession, changes its genetic and protein fingerprint and over time it starts behaving in slightly different ways and that slight difference is enough to render a particular retroviral drug ineffective. And we also studied in previous lecture about antimicrobial resistance, which basically is a pathogen that was susceptible to antibiotics and is no longer susceptible. It is no longer responding or rather dying in presence of the antibiotic that it used to um, die, die in presence of. So this is evolution of pathogens. And so we have uh, multiple um, multiple sources of novel pathogens. One of them for example is new diseases coming up. So this is new pathogens that we have not, that humankind has not seen before. Now these are really tricky because we do not have immunity because the human immune system has not been exposed to these pathogens. Our defensive blood cells do not have any memory of um, these pathogens and do not know how to uh, deal with them. So these new pathogens with, of which MERS is a very good example and we will be talking a little bit more about MERS outbreak pretty soon. The other is evolving pathogens. So pathogens that we are already familiar with but they are changing their behavior and our current problem talks about resistance to drugs. So evolving pathogens one of our highlight here is the antimicrobial resistance. Pathogens are resistant to antimicrobials and the other is apart from antimicrobials they are also resistant to retroviral drugs. So new pathogens, evolving pathogens, the ones we or we can also have um, re-emergence of pathogens. For example, smallpox has been eradicated from world. There is no human career known to us that has smallpox and can be source of smallpox. However, if by any chance smallpox makes a re-entry into human population, then this will be a challenge of re-emergence because 
many people currently are not immunized against smallpox and do not have the immunity to fight it off. So these three situations, when we have new pathogens coming up or pathogens that are changing their behavior and making it harder to treat and pathogens that we have forgotten that were eradicated, they re-emerge. In these cases, in all the three cases here, what we will have is a new problem where we, we need to understand how are these pathogens coming up from environment, how are they evolving in our environment and what is the microbiology of these pathogens. Now one example I would like to give you is antibiotics. In previous lectures, I talked about how antibiotics are actually derived from environmental microbes like soil bacteria. So many soil bacteria to communicate with each other and to strive off competition, what they do is they develop these compounds called antibiotics. And now we, and we learned that the, there are pathogens that are susceptible to antibiotics and soil, microbiome, um, soil microbes that are resistant to it. Now this resistance got transferred to pathogens and now we have deadly pathogens. So the transfer of um, resistance from soil bacteria to pathogenic bacteria happens in environment because soil bacteria is found in environment. So this is an environmental route of evolution, succession or change in the behavior and characteristics of a pathogen. So definitely environment is very, very important here. Also when we are talking about new pathogens, especially this is contagious disease, infectious disease, we want to know what is the route of infection. Is this disease spread through air, aerosols like tuberculosis and flu or is it spread through body fluids like HIV, hepatitis C or is it spread through food and water, contaminated food and water. So if, does it have a fecal oral route? Unless we have this information about the environmental routes through which the pathogen spreads and infects one human being to another, we cannot tackle the new pathogens. And also the, when it comes to re-emergence of pathogens, we need to understand where are the pathogens re-emerging from. So if you put an end to the source, we, it will help us contain the, um, the epidemic. So let's get started with MERS. So as I said just a few minutes earlier, MERS is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, a viral respiratory disease caused by a novel coronavirus. So this is an example of a new pathogen coming up. So in this case, we need to understand how does this pathogen transmit from one human, sick human being to a healthy human being. So we need to understand the transmission route. The other thing that we need to understand is um, once we know the transmission route is how is this pathogen changing in human body and how is it changing in environment. Now this is a, there was a very interesting study I think done in uh, reported in 2013 and 20, or 2014 in nature where they noticed that uh, monkeys that have uh, dormant tuberculosis in their lungs, so the tuberculosis, not a full blown tuberculosis infection, but they have tuberculosis mycobacterium sitting in their lungs in very well encased uh, shells and uh, WBCs are around them making sure the infection does not spread and then these monkeys were given uh, anti tuberculosis drugs over time. And they noticed that in presence of this drug, the tuberculosis mycobacterium underwent genetic changes. And we and that study was trying to understand the rate at which they were changing, undergoing mutation to predict the rate at which we will develop an antibiotic resistant mycobacterium that will cause tuberculosis. So we need to understand how is the microbe changing in environment whether in human body or outside. Once we know that we will know what rate can we expect the resistance to show up in this particular disease. So we need to understand the succession of pathogen in environment. and also human body, how is it changing? Alrighty, and one thing that I did not mention, before we learn about the transmission or succession, we need to have a clear grasp on the source of pathogen. Where, does, where did this disease come from? Is it a bird flu virus? Is it a swine flu virus? So we need to understand this. Alrighty. So, um, Coronaviruses are large family of viruses that cause diseases ranging from common cold to SARS. So before MERS, there was a SARS epidemic in China and uh, other Asian countries, severe acute respiratory syndrome with very severe uh, symptoms 
and uh, it was very effectively contained by Chinese authorities. So, good job. Now, typical MERS syndrome would include fever, cough and shortness of breath, your typical flu, right? And pneumonia is common, but it is not always present. Gastrointestinal symptoms including diarrhea were also reported. Some lab confirmed cases of MERS are, were reported to be asymptomatic, meaning that they do not have any symptoms, but they can transmit diseases. Most of these asymptomatic cases have been detected following aggressive contact tracing of laboratory confirmed case. So, this is very important, we need to understand what is this contract tracing. So, dear students, when we talk about diseases and let us say we are interested in the transmission route, so I want to know how does a sick person get disease. Obviously, the sick person caught the coronavirus either from a non-living thing, you know like a fomite, so if the person touched it or drank contaminated water ate contaminated food or came in contact with sick individuals. So, in epidemiology one of the things we do is we take a good questionnaire and we trace back the history of the person who is sick. So, the patient is asked who did you meet, what places did you travel, what food did you eat, where were you living, what um, novel things that you came in contact with in past x, y, z number of days. So, this is contact tracing, we are tracing back the recent contact history of the patient to get an idea of the transmission route of the disease. Now, uh, when they did this um, contact tracing in case of MERS because it was a very fast moving outbreak, in fact epidemic, what um, they did was when the person would say well I met x, y, z person at this particular time and then if enough patients report I also met XYZ patient, XYZ person then they will call the XYZ person even if the person is asymptomatic which means the person is not showing symptoms, is not sick because the person is not showing the symptoms of sickness then the person is tested for the virus and in this case of MERS they did find that the source of um, MERS virus in many sick patients were seemingly healthy people who were carrying MERS virus. They were asymptomatic, but they had um, but they had the disease in them. So, this is a more clinical approach to epidemiology trying to find out. We go, we find out humans, we find fomites and in humans we do their clinical testing. This is very much of medical science microbiology, medical microbiology or when it comes to fomites, we go and then we do environmental microbiology. Alrighty. So, in this case the death rate was very very high, nearly 35 percent of everybody of all the patients that were reported with MERS died and uh, now here is the beauty thing. Now, they were people when they were trying to find out, if you remember we want to know the source of infection. So, when people um, traced back the history, okay, who were the original people that got MERS and which infected the Saudi Arabian people or people in Middle East. When they traced back the original people, they wanted to know how did these people get coronavirus that caused MERS. Now, in this case, what you do is you find out when did they first get uh, MERS virus in their body, what kind of food they were eating, where, what was the source of water, who was cooking their food, what was in their environment, did they go swimming or what were their, who was there in the environment. Now, this is where the concept of one health comes into picture and that is what I wanted to introduce you to in this lecture. So, in one health we talk about the cross link, the close and intimate link between public health, environmental health and veterinary health. So, in case of MERS what people found out that most likely the source of virus was a camel. The ca it is a camel virus, so basically it is a camel flu that mutated and started infecting human beings. Current scientific evidence and how do you collect this scientific evidence? You do microbiological studies using the tools talked in this class. Suggested that dromedary camels are major reservoir host for MERS COV and an animal source of MERS infection in humans. However, the exact route of transmission remains unknown. We do not know if it was really camels like were they intermediate source or were they the original source that is not known yet. Like maybe there was an original source that infected camels and then camels transmitted it to humans. So, they were intermediary not the original source or maybe the camels infected something else which infected human beings. But exact transmission route is not known yet. 
So this is a scope of environmental uh, and veterinary science and medical science to come together and study the exact transmission route of SARS. But here is the thing, this virus does not pass very easily. You require really close contact to pass uh, this virus and this happens when you are treating a patient for example who has MERS but you are not properly protecting yourself. Alrighty, now let us look at this particular infographic. This infographic focuses on the countries that had a f um, that showed um, MERS in outbreak. So in um, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Qatar and UAE, there were um, some cases and a very high mortality rate and in European nations the mortality rate was slightly lower than it was in Saudi Arabia. Alrighty. Now no notice here an analysis published in February of blood samples from dromedary camels 1992 to 2010 found evidence of MERS going back to two decades. So it was not that this virus came up in um, 2012 infected camels, infected human beings, but it was already per subsisting, persisting in the environment for more than two decades before it infected hundreds of people across Middle East, across Europe and caused a quite substantial fatality rate. So this again brings us to the importance of understanding environmental microbial communities. If two decades earlier people were already studying the environmental microbiology, the microbiology of animals, domesticated animals, wild animals and understood how what kind of viruses are present, how they are mutating, at what rate they are mutating, it would have been possible to pinpoint and can understand it already this virus has mutated enough and it, it is infecting more mammals than it used to infect earlier and then we find that okay now it, it is also infecting human beings or human like animals such as apes. If there are apes, there are no apes to my knowledge in Saudi Arabia but in case of um, populations that are very similar in behavior to mankind for example pig has big, we have very uh, close anato anatomical relationship with pig. So in these ma other mammals that are very similar to human beings, if they are beginning to get infected by this particular pathogen, we know all right, it might spread to humans, let us put a stop to it. So this is where the it is very important to understand the environmental microbiology because remember most of our pathogens and most of our resistance comes from environmental microbiome. Alrighty, now it is a good time to understand some key terminology that is used in epidemic which will help you understand the spread of diseases whether it is somewhere else or in India. Now remember one thing, the diseases usually they do not respect geographical and political boundaries. So we might say okay this is an Indian disease, no not necessarily so. The disease does not know that it is Indian, for example MERS does not know that it is a Middle East respiratory, uh, respiratory syndrome. So it will not say okay I need to only stay in Middle East, it will Wherever it can carry itself, it will carry and it will li like to proliferate. Alrighty, so coming here, let us understand the four important terms, endemic disease, sporadic di disease, epidemic and pandemic. So this particular graph is a very nice graph, it shows North American and South American continents. Now if you note here, let us start with sporadic disease. So if every now and then you have some unique cases of a particular disease coming up, they are not clustered in geography, so it is not that there is one particular place here that has lot of diseases for a particular, um, lot of incidences for a particular disease. Like okay, one person here, okay, one person there, big deal. Now this kind of outbreaks are called as sporadic outbreaks. For example, um, let us say dengue is not in season, unfortunately now in many North Indian cities and in many Indian cities in fact. Dengue, chikungunya, malaria, they are seasonal diseases much like flu. We sort of expect them already, rainy season is this close, this far, dengue cases will probably rise. So when it is not common, let us say dengue is not in season and we have some sporadic cases, we cannot say this is an outbreak. Alrighty, now what is an endemic disease? So endemic disease is here, okay, now we are having new cases of diseases showing up and now the thing about endemic disease is that they are usually geographically contained. For example, I often say that where I come from in Uttar Pradesh, my hometown, amoebic dysentery caused by Entamoeba histolytica is endemic to that region because there is always uh, Entamoeba histolytica that somehow contaminates our water sources in groundwater and surface water 
and eventually ends up in on our food, in our water, drinking water. And there is always this portion of people who are carrying and are infected by endamoeba histolytica. So in that case, this is an endemic disease. What differentiates sporadic disease with endemic disease is sporadic disease pops like popcorn. Okay, one disease here, one disease here. But there is no relationship between the incidences. In endemic disease, usually they are geographically contained and we can always expect that all right, at this particular region there will always be a this portion of people who will have this disease. So it is endemic. Now when an endemic zone starts gathering a number of incidences in an endemic zone or in a place which is which was not endemic to the disease, number of outbreaks, number of uh, incidences of disease start increasing rapidly and they start spreading both in number of people, so more people are falling sick and also it is spreading geographically, then it is called as an epidemic. For example, H1N1 epidemic, so initially sporadic cases of H1N1, treat them, you are fine. And then there is a particular region that it always has H1N1 infections, hopefully not because H1N1 can be very dangerous disease to have, especially if people are immune compromised or have poor health to begin with. So uh, if there are regions that always have a particular portion of H1N1, then that's endemic to that region. Now, the, if there is a location where you don't, you don't have cases of H1N1, but somebody falls sick, sporadic, but now more people are falling sick, now there is an outbreak, now a substantial amount of people are falling sick and the disease is spreading outside the city boundaries, now it is an epidemic. Now it is a pandemic when different regions across the globe, so we have Mexico, we have USA and we have lot of South American countries here. Now in different parts of the world diseases are the same diseases having an outbreak, so pandemic includes a much, much larger geographical and political area. Alright, now let us look at these words, I have been using them quite uh, casually. Incidence of disease, which means that number of people who are showing up with fresh cases of disease, number of fresh patients. Prevalence is at any given time, how many uh, people are sick. So prevalence is a snapshot in time. So at any given time, T, how many people are sick? 500, 400, that is your prevalence. Incidence is rate at which new cases are coming. So this is mostly Dn by Dt and this is Nt. How many people have the disease right now? Virulence is how fast the disease spreads. So virulence gives me an idea of disease, will I fall sick? If more, it's more virulent disease and I get exposed to it regardless of my immune system, condition of my immune system, I'll probably fall sick. And because it is very virulent disease, infectious dose is perhaps very low and I will spread it more to people. Carriers are people who, well, typically we talk about people who are asymptomatic, so they are healthy, they are not sick because they are not showing symptoms, but they have the virus, they have the pathogen in them and they can spread it. So this is a big case uh, problem for endem diseases. For example, there are certain portions in our country, India, which have hepatitis A and hepatitis E as endemic in it. So they are seemingly healthy people who have the virus in them. Their liver is not showing a uh, full blown jaundice, but there is slight damage that is being done over in, in, in a longer time span. So in these are the carriers, they will spread the disease. So for example, in my hometown where endamoeba histolytica caused amoebic dysentery is endemic, many of us are carriers. We don't always have the dysentery symptoms or diarrhea, but our fecal matter will carry endamoeba histolytica and that can infect, uh, that can that contaminate our food or water and infect people. So these are carriers typically asymptomatic. Now mortality is the rate of death in a disease. Morbidity is the rate of uh, loss of well-being, loss of health. So morbidity may result in mortality. Uh, another uh, term that is used in epidemiology is YLD, years lost due to disability. So let's say I get MERS and now I have lost uh, two weeks of my uh, 
active contribution to economy, active contribution to my community, then how, what is my viability, what is the viability of MERS for me? It is to be 2 weeks by total number of weeks in a year. So, this is the number of years I have lost in disability. Alrighty, now let us look at um, immunity. So, when we talk about Im epidemiology, when we talk about diseases spreading, another very important thing we need to understand is how fast is the disease spreading. So, this is where you get the term R0. R0 basically is a number that tells me how many people will you infect if you are a sick patient. So, for example, if I have mumps, then I will infect anywhere from 4 to 7 people. If I have polio, I will infect anywhere from 5 to 7 people, smallpox 5 to 7, diphtheria and rubella 6 to 7. This is really large number because you know if I have rubella then I will infect 6, 7 more people who will infect 6, 7 more people. So, it becomes like a, like a, a chain, a chain cycle. And um, pertussis and measles are highly contagious. So, the more the value of R0, the more you know your disease is going to spread. Now, what does R0 depend upon? R0 depends upon the route of transmission. For example, diseases that spread through air, like through air sores, through sneezing and wheezing, they tend to have a higher R0 value. If I live in a populated country, I sneeze and I am already infecting four people. I go somewhere else, I sneeze again, I have infected four more people. I go somewhere else, I mean same day, I travel somewhere else, I sneeze and I infect four more people. Also, aerosol um, laden pathogens, they deposit themselves on surfaces, making them fomite. So, anybody, let us say there is a child who is just playing with the walls and they touch the wall and then they lick it and next thing they know is that they are infected too. So, airborne transmission usually higher R0 okay? and then also same is the case with water uh, borne diseases. The next thing is infectious dose. How many pathogens does it take to make you fall sick? Giardia, one pathogen is enough, 1 to 10. Cholera, very low amount is required. Next thing that is very important is um, fate of pathogen in environment. Now, this cholera and HIV are very good example. Cholera lives very long in the fecal matter. On the other hand, HIV does not live very long in the air. So, if an HIV patient's bodily fluids are sitting somewhere, the HIV will die very quickly, will be damaged very quickly and the other person who innocently gets in contact with that uh, um, bo bodily fluid of the patient will not get the disease. So, fate of pathogens in environment is also important. On a community level, population density is very important. So, in a country like India, where population density is very high for our cities and many of our towns, actually most of our towns and most of our cities population density is very high. So, the closer the human beings live with each other, airborne pathogens will find it easier to transmit. Also, the closer we live, the more collected collective waste is substantial in um, its quantity and so the pool, the community pool of pathogens becomes very large, our environment is likely to be dirtier and people get affected. Next, this brings to the next point, R0 also depends upon the environmental hygiene. So, you have clean drinking water to supply people because you have done a very good job at wastewater treatment and a very good job at drinking water treatment. Do not worry, your environmental status is good and your um, Public hygiene is pretty nice, so people practice good hygiene steps, R0 would be low. Next thing R0 depends upon is the um, mortality rate and morbidity rate. Of disease. For example, Ebola has very high mortality rate. In some countries, some places it had mortality rate between 80 to 90 percent. So, when diseases have such high mortality rate, they tend to have low R0 because the host, the carrier will die before it can infect enough number of human beings. And same with morbidity, if the person 
uh, collapses like in Ebola because of this hemorrhagic fever, then the person is not in a condition to go and travel in trains and visit for populated areas and infect many people. So usually diseases with high mortality and high morbidity have very low um, mm, R naught value and they usually stay self-contained. This was the case with Ebola before people started moving more frequently f to Africa and from Africa. The Ebola outbreaks would stay contained in one village or two village or five village. The village would be wiped out with very few survivors, but then the other, it, the other parts of the country were not affected. Now this brings us to the last point of our class today is immunity. Thankfully for all the diseases here, we have very good immuni uh, immunization program. And this brings us to here, if we have people who are immunized in the community, at least a good percentage of people are immunized in the community, then the R0 becomes very low and people don't get sick. This is the threshold value. For example, for pertussis, if 92-94% of people are immunized against pertussis, then we won't have per pertussis cases and outbreaks in our community. And because R0 value is low for mumps, if mumps, for we need only three-fourths of the population to be immunized. So let's look here. So in this population, this is pre-immunization. Blue are the people who are not immunized, but they are healthy. Red are the infected people, they are not immunized. So they will start spreading the disease. No one is immunized and the contagious disease will very quickly spread to the population, leaving very few healthy individuals. Now let's look here. In this particular community, we have some people who took the shots. So they are immunized people. And now the, again, we have the same number of population. We have same number of in initial out cases. And we will note that few healthy people who were going to remain healthy anyway, them and the immunized people, accepting them, everybody will fall sick. Now let's say in this community, we have majority of people who are immunized, except for few people who are not immunized. What we notice is that the disease will perhaps make one more person fall sick, but the community in whole will not get disease. So now here, notice you had four people who were not immunized. Out of four, only one person got so sick. The other three are healthy because of community immunity. The community was immunized and that protected the three non-immunized people. Alright students, this is all for today. In next lecture, we will continue about One Health and talk about how in many cases, in fact, I will give you two case studies. In uh, many cases, we have our understanding of environmental health and our understanding of environmental routes of proliferation of diseases that helps us tackle the problem. Thank you very much. Music